Despite a few hitches here and there, Project Mercury was progressing smoothly. With two suborbital flights under their belt, NASA was ready to move on to the next phase, putting an American into orbit. While the Soviet Union had effectively killed two birds with one stone with Vostok 1 and achieved crewed spaceflight and crewed orbital spaceflight in the same mission, NASA's program was more incremental, mostly due to the way the Mercury spacecraft was altered throughout the course of the program. The capsule that Alan Shepard rode into suborbit would be very different from the one Gus Grissom rode into suborbit, which would be very different from the ones that would go all the way into orbit, although on the surface, they all look quite similar. Moving on to orbital flights meant changing the launch vehicle as well. The Redstone booster, being modified from a short-range ballistic missile, was far from capable of placing anything into orbit. The vehicle to perform that job was the Atlas booster, which was derived from an ICBM, making it much more powerful. Testing of the booster dated back to before the first crewed Mercury Redstone flights, the two vehicles being developed in parallel to one another. Mercury Atlas 1, launched in July of 1960 with an uncrewed capsule, failed 58 seconds into ascent. As it wasn't visible above the cloud cover, it was difficult to determine what had happened from telemetry alone, though it was clear that the vehicle had broke apart from some amount of stress on it. This led to modifications to strengthen both the spacecraft and launch vehicle, as well as to use a more shallow ascent path to reduce the bending stress. Mercury Atlas II, launched in February of 1961, went much more smoothly, bringing Mercury spacecraft number 6 to an apogee of 183 kilometers or 114 miles, and to a speed just a few hundred miles per hour short of orbital velocity, intended to test the spacecraft's capabilities of re-entry. Reportedly, when the booster passed through Max-Q, there was cheering in the control room that everything had held together through the most stressful part of ascent. Despite a bit of propellant slosh toward the end of ascent, all test objectives were met, but the next flight would not go so smoothly. Launched only two months later, Mercury Atlas III was intended to put an uncrewed Mercury spacecraft all the way into orbit and incorporated a number of technical improvements on the booster. However, only a few seconds into the ascent, the vehicle failed to initiate a pitch and roll sequence continuing to fly straight up into the air. After 43 seconds, the range safety officer sent the destruct command, the launch escape system activated, and the booster exploded, raining down into the Atlantic Ocean. Investigations revealed an unknown fault somewhere in the guidance system, so the spacecraft itself that had blasted away from the explosion was fished out of the water and put atop a new booster for a new test. Upgrades to the MA-4 booster caused significant delays, dragging the launch date out to September of 1961. This one went far more smoothly, successfully placing the uncrewed spacecraft into low Earth orbit, a first for the Mercury program. Small concerns popped up here and there, including a failure of two thrusters that slowed Mission Control's ability to turn the capsule around for deorbit. However, since it achieved all of its stated objectives, Mercury Atlas IV would be the last uncrewed test flight of the system. So to speak. Mercury Atlas V was marketed to the public as a demonstration of the safety of NASA's testing approach. Since they had only one successful Mercury Atlas flight under their belt at this point, they stated that, quote, the men in charge of Project Mercury have insisted on orbiting the chimpanzee as a necessary preliminary checkout of the entire Mercury program before risking a human astronaut. This was played to counter the Soviets' approach of one-shotting a man into orbit, painting it as reckless and lucky to have succeeded. NASA also worked hard to downplay the fact that, in November of that year, a monkey died during an Atlas E launch failure, insisting that it was a different booster and was entirely unrelated to the Mercury program and this chimp's test flight. This test didn't go very well for Enos the chimpanzee, but don't worry, he came home safe and sound. Enos, much like Ham, the previous space chimp, was trained for the Mercury program for a long time before being selected for MA5. It was similarly slow to prepare like the previous flight, taking a total of 40 weeks of pre-flight preparation, the longest in the program yet. Finally, on October 29, 1961, three chimpanzees were moved into quarters at the Cape to prepare for the flight. Enos, a name meaning man in Hebrew, was chosen as the primary candidate, and he had four backups, Dwayne, Jim, Rocky, and Ham, veteran of Mercury Redstone 2. The plan for the flight was similar to this previous chimp flight, except that now the capsule would be placed into orbit. The spacecraft itself would be controlled from the ground, 
while the chimp in its enclosed capsule would be performing physical tasks in response to instructions in the form of lights. A bulb would light up above a switch, and if the chimp flipped the switch in time, they received a reward in the form of a banana pellet. If the chimp didn't respond in a timely manner, it would be given what NASA refers to as a quote, mild electric shock as punishment. And this is when we remember that it's the early 1960s and animal rights are not quite what they are today. Enos and his self-contained spacesuit couch were placed in the spacecraft about five hours before the launch on November 29th, 1961. Liftoff and ascent was nominal, launching the spacecraft into a 99 by 147 mile orbit, or 159 by 237 kilometers. Now the countdown approaches zero and last off. History in the making. Everything went exceptionally smoothly, that is, until the capsule was finally separated from the booster. On his first orbit, everything seemed relatively nominal, except that the capsule's clock had fallen out of sync and was reading 18 seconds too fast. A command was sent as it made its first pass over Cape Canaveral to correct it, and shortly afterwards, things began to go wrong. The MA-5 capsule was drifting. One of its thrusters that controlled roll had malfunctioned, causing the capsule to move away from its intended attitude. After a little while, the automatic stabilization system would fire thrusters and swing the capsule back in the right direction. Throughout this flight, this correction maneuver occurred nine times, eating up a total of around nine and a half pounds of fuel, while the first orbit before the thruster failure used around one and a half pounds for the entire circle around the Earth. Furthermore, in the middle of the second orbit, Mission Control began to notice that it was getting pretty warm inside the capsule. The temperature inside Enos's couch suit had gone from 65 degrees Fahrenheit or 18 degrees Celsius to 80 Fahrenheit or 27 Celsius. As Enos's temperature began to increase in turn with the suit, the medical observers became worried about the chimp's safety. However, by the time the spacecraft was above Hawaii for the second time, the temperatures had returned to normal and the equipment was functioning properly again. Enos was okay, but the attitude problems persisted, leading to the decision to cut the mission short. Intending to complete three orbits, the decision was made to begin the retrofire shortly before the end of the second orbit. Perhaps it was for the best, because during the flight, a new problem arose that, to my understanding, mission control didn't seem to be aware was happening at the time. Enos was executing his tasks with a reinforcement system that gave him banana pellets for correct answers and gave him a little jolt for wrong answers. However, at some point, something broke. Despite continuing to perform correct commands, the system started to jolt Enos every single time. The number of times varies depending on the source. The popular lore is that 76 shocks were delivered and is backed up by a book called The Great Apes, A History by Chris Herzfeld and Jane Goodall. However, the only actual source from NASA that puts a number to it claims that number to be only 35. Regardless, the reinforcement system was shot and Enos no longer had a way of knowing he was pressing the correct commands. He began to press all of them, one by one, testing his way systematically through all of them to find some kind of alternate solution. Finally, after receiving 35, or 76 depending on who you believe, shocks to his body, the switch returned to normal function, and Enos continued through the program. Mercury Atlas V splashed down safely about 250 miles south of Bermuda. The spacecraft was picked up, placed on the deck, and the hatch was opened. Enos was recovered safe and sound, though he had removed all of his medical electrodes and his diaper. MA5 was a complete success, and it was time to put an American into orbit. A press conference was held in early December of 1961. Mercury Atlas VI was announced, the first crewed orbital spaceflight in the U.S. space program. The prime pilot was John Glenn, and Scott Carpenter was his backup. At the same time, they announced Mercury Atlas VII, with Deke Slayton and Wally Schirra as pilot and backup respectively. Among the largest changes to the hardware of this flight was actually inside the cabin. Glenn had a small medical kit that had everything from morphine, shock symptom treatments, motion sickness treatments, and stimulants. He also had a survival kit with desalter kits, dye markers, distress signals of varying kinds, a small raft, survival rations, and a small radio. There was a lot of focus put on Glenn's safety, largely because the effect of an orbital spaceflight on human beings was completely unknown. The only people who knew were the Soviets, and they weren't sharing. Glenn also had a camera, a small 35mm film camera that he bought himself. He brought this along with some pushback from NASA. They feared that cameras might prove to be very distracting for the astronauts. With an initial launch date of January 16th, MA6 was postponed several times until February 20th. There were a mix of reasons. In addition to a fuel leak causing two weeks of repairs, bad weather kept getting in the way. Mercury Atlas 1 had failed somewhere above the clouds, and nobody had been able to see what happened, so NASA's policy became to launch only in clear skies, 
At the same time, they also needed to keep the anxious public as happy as possible, so they kept emphasizing the need for a high degree of preparation and safety standards for this first crewed orbital spaceflight. John Glenn climbed aboard his spacecraft, which he had named Friendship 7, on February 20th, 1103 UTC. The hatch was bolted in place, twice, after one bolt was found to be broken, and the entire process was repeated. After two hours and 17 minutes of holds, Mercury Atlas 6 roared into the sky, Glenn's pulse climbing to 110 beats per minute. 10, 9... After some pretty high vibrations through Max-Q, the flight smoothed out, and staging as well as tower jettison was nominal. When the sustainer engine cut off, Friendship 7 was safely in orbit, only 7 feet per second below its intended velocity. The capsule was separated from the booster, and performed its turnaround maneuver into the proper attitude. America was in orbit. Roger, zero G, and I feel fine. Capsule is turning around. Oh, that view is tremendous. The first orbit was mostly nominal and uneventful. Glenn saw the sun set from orbit, saw a dust storm in Nigeria, and the lights of Perth, Australia. As the sun rose over Australia, Glenn was momentarily taken aback when he suddenly found himself completely surrounded by a field of tiny glowing specks, something he called fireflies, floating around outside the capsule. Quote, I am in a big mass of some very small particles. They're brilliantly lit up like they're luminescent. I never saw anything like it. They round a little. They're coming by the capsule and they look like little stars. A whole shower of them coming by. They swirl around the capsule and go in front of the window and they're all brilliantly lighted. Hey Roger, Friendship 7, uh, we'll get a blood pressure check. Uh, I still have some of these particles that I cannot identify coming around the capsule occasionally, over. Uh, Roger, how big are these particles? Over. Uh, very small. I would indicate they're of the order of a sixteenth of an inch or smaller. Uh, they just by the window. And uh, I can see them against the dark sky. Uh, just as it, just at sunrise, there were literally thousands of them. It looked like just a myriad of stars. Over. It was later determined that these were bits of ice crystals that formed and then broke off the spacecraft, winking in the rising sun around him. Shortly before the second orbit began, problems with the stabilization system began to arise. A yaw thruster was malfunctioning. Glenn tried different control modes to figure out the most fuel-efficient way to keep the spacecraft steady, and 20 minutes later, the yaw thruster began working again. After switching back to automatic control, the opposite yaw thruster malfunctioned, causing Glenn to leave the spacecraft in fly-by-wire mode for the remainder of the flight. However, the problems were far from over. Don Arabian, Flight Systems Controller, made a note of a strange reading regarding the spacecraft's landing system. As Friendship 7 passed over Cape Canaveral at the beginning of its second orbit, John Glenn was asked to check the landing bag deploy switch and verify that it was in the off position. Glenn confirmed that it was, and then became suspicious when the next site he passed over made the same request, then the next site. He was right to be suspicious. According to the data being received by Mercury Control, the heat shield and landing bag were no longer in the locked position and only being held against the spacecraft by the straps that held the retrofire package. While Mission Control tried to figure out what to do, Friendship 7 passed over the Indian Ocean, where a tracking ship was being buffeted by a heavy storm. Originally planning to release balloons to see if Glenn could see them, the ship instead fired flares up into the air. Glenn couldn't see them, though he could see the flashes of lightning from the storm they were experiencing. One last problem arose during the second orbit. Glenn's spacesuit was too warm. Beginning as he had passed over the Canary Islands, he finally tried to adjust it while he flew over the Indian Ocean. By the time he reached Australia, a signal light warned him that the cabin was getting too humid. All the way to Splashdown, Glenn would have to carefully balance keeping his suit cool and keeping the cabin from filling with condensation. Glenn flew his third orbit without any major issues. The entire time, Mission Control was monitoring the problem with the landing bag. Over Hawaii, Glenn was asked to toggle the deploy switch into the automatic position, hoping for a light to come on. It didn't, and Control was left undecided on what to do. Leave the retrofire pack on as a retainer, or jettison it in the usual planned manner. 
Eventually, the decision was made to leave the pack in place during re-entry until the spacecraft was over Texas. Four hours and 33 minutes after launch, Friendship 7 was nearing the coast of California, and John Glenn was preparing for atmospheric re-entry. The retro rockets fired, and Glenn had the same sensation as Shepard and Grissom that he was suddenly moving backwards, though he was only slowing down slightly. As the capsule began streaking through the upper atmosphere, with the pack still attached to the bottom, Glenn noted hearing noises that sounded like things were bumping against the capsule, possibly bits of the pack or the straps. He also noted that there was a quote, real fireball outside, and even saw a strap from the retro package hang over the spacecraft window, consumed into ashes in the re-entry plasma. At peak re-entry heating, Glenn saw chunks coming off of something and flying by the window. He believed that the retro pack had been jettisoned at that point, and was worried that what he was seeing was his heat shield disintegrating, however it was simply the pack breaking apart in the fireball. I felt like a falling leaf, Glenn would later say, as Friendship 7 began to oscillate from side to side, making him unable to control it manually. He used the auxiliary damping system to stabilize it, which helped, but there was little fuel remaining from needing to correct the earlier yaw error. 51 seconds before the drogue chute deployed, the fuel ran out, and the spacecraft again began to sway around. Glenn contemplated deploying the drogue chute manually to regain stability, but before he could, the chute opened automatically at 28,000 feet. Glenn reported that everything was in good shape, and after the main chute deployed, he manually dropped the landing bag, which worked as normal. It never had become unsecured from the spacecraft at all. The reading at Mission Control was simply due to a bad sensor, and Friendship 7 splashed down safely about 220 miles northwest of Puerto Rico, and 40 miles off from the planned landing zone. After being pulled onto the destroyer USS Noah, Glenn intended to leave the capsule through the upper hatch, but the heat was getting to him, and instead, he told the ship's crew to stand clear, and he blew the side hatch. The plunger's recoil cut his knuckles through his glove, a wound that Gus Grissom did not have if you recall the previous episode. As he got out and stood on the deck, Glenn stated, It was hot in there. Project Mercury had achieved its goal, put Americans into space. All that was left now was to close out the remaining flights and move on to the next big leg of the space race. But we'll come back to that another day. <laughs>